presents a Talk of the Times event on the issue of intelligent design versus evolution in Seattle on April 26th. I'm awfully glad you're here to join us for tonight's conversation. Uh, there are still, if you're looking for seats, there are a few stray singles scattered throughout the center section, and then there are two and three seats available together on the extreme sides. But believe it or not, the sight line is quite good and the acoustics are very good on the sides, so don't hesitate to sit on the sides. <coughs> I'd like to welcome everybody to this, the first of uh, 2006's uh, Talk of the Times, uh, which is a series we do with uh, the Seattle Times. We're glad to sponsor tonight's event with them. I want to call your attention to a few uh, upcoming events at Town Hall before I get to introductions of the, of the speakers. Tomorrow night, we'll bring Seattle Follies, our popular political cabaret built on a solid foundation of ill-advised satire, ill-considered opinion, and beer price to move. Guests include Norm Stamper, Dave Minert, Reggie Watts, and some eccentric and inspiring Fisher poets we dug up for you in Astoria, Oregon. Uh, that'll be downstairs at 7.30 tomorrow night. Uh, the next talk of the Times is scheduled for May 19th, and uh, it's appreciably more serious than Seattle Follies tomorrow night. It's a one-on-one -on -one with Simon Shama, the acclaimed historian and art historian, author of Citizen, Rembrandt's Eyes, Landscape and Memory, the landmark TV series A History of Britain, and the recent Rough Crossings. He'll be joined by Seattle Times book editor Marianne Gwynn. It came together a bit too late to be included in our calendar, um, so make a mental note. That's on May 19th, Friday evening, 7.30 p.m. downstairs. I urge you to pick up Town Hall's calendar, actually, on your way out, because you'll learn more about our jam-packed May. I love to say I designed it this way, but we sort of stumbled into a focus on women's political engagement with appearances by NARAL President uh, Kate Michaelman, MoveOn.org co-founder Joan Blades and local activist Kristen Rao Finkbeiner, pollster Celinda Lake, and anti-war activist Cindy Sheehan, Nobel Prize winner Sheeran Abadi, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. Like I said, it's a packed month for us, and I hope you'll be back a few times. Finally, a quick word about tonight's format. We've already begun distributing, or we're about to begin distributing question cards. Uh, you'll want to write down your name and any question you might have, and we'll be back to pick them up from you in about 30 minutes. We'll use these questions to conclude the evening after a moderated conversation. Know that we may not be able to get to every question, so write your name, write your question, and we'll do our best to get to it. As anyone who's followed the subject of tonight's conversation will tell you, even the semantic frame of the issue proves debatable, and hotly so. So I'll tiptoe into it by saying that the Seattle Times and Town Hall are pleased to welcome to the stage two of our region's most articulate voices in the recent and contentious conversation about the nature of the origin and development of life. And that there's a reason tonight's conversation between two scientists also sits comfortably within the purview of the paper's chief political reporter. Stephen C. Meyer is the director and senior fellow of the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute in Seattle. He earned his PhD in the history and philosophy of science from Cambridge University for a dissertation entitled Of Clues and Causes, a Methodological Interpretation of Origin of Life Studies. Previously, he worked as a geophysicist with the Atlantic Richfield Company after earning his undergraduate degrees in physics and geology at Whitworth College. Meyer has co-authored two books, Darwinism, Design, and Public Education, and Science and Evidence of Design in the Universe. He is joined on our stage by Dr. Peter Ward, a paleontologist and University of Washington professor of geology, biology, zoology, and astrobiology. His work specializes in the Cretaceous tertiary extinction and mass extinctions generally. He is the author or co-author of 12 books, many on biodiversity and the fossil record. Titles include Rare Earth, Why Complex Life is Uncommon in the Universe, Gorgon, Obsession, Paleontology, and the Greatest Mass Extinction, and his latest, Life as We Do Not Know It, the NASA search for and synthesis of alien life. Here to lead tonight's conversation is the Seattle Times' esteemed political reporter, David Postman. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Meyer, Peter Ward, and David Postman. Wow. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, the uh, audience estimates grew quickly the last uh, couple of days. Pre appreciate you all coming out. A um, couple of quick uh, words on format, which is there really isn't going to be much of a format. It's not a debate. We're not going to be timing people. There's no bells or buzzers or hooks or anything of that sort. Uh, we hope to have a conversation. Um, the uh, uh, understanding is the, the, the guests will jump in when they feel they want to. Uh, we will be polite, um, but they'll always listen to me when I tell them to stop. Um, 
Uh, as you heard, question cards are coming around, uh, so um, try to be concise. We will be uh, filtering those out a little bit uh, and starting to ask them, you know, about 40 minutes into the, the program. Um, I don't know that we'll get to all the questions. Um, we, I think we're asking you to put your names on there in case we want to try to get a follow-up from somebody. So, uh, again, we're looking for a little bit of dialogue and, and uh, looking for open minds at least uh, for, for 90 minutes so we can have the discussion. Um, obviously, it's a contentious issue. Um, I learned about it firsthand, uh, how contentious it is, this morning when a story that I wrote appeared in the Seattle Times and my email started to fill up before uh, dawn. As people around the country were reading the article, somebody obviously had posted it somewhere, and I heard from uh, esteemed uh, uh, academics from around the country, and I must say most of them, um, well, all of them unhappy with me, and um, all of them uh, uh, opponents of intelligent design, um, pretty clearly convinced that I was, in the Seattle Times, was in the business of promoting intelligent design. And, and I was a little taken back by that. And it wasn't until later in the day or in the morning that a colleague emailed me and said, have you looked at the Discovery Institute blog? Uh, they're on to you. So I, I looked there, and there's some criticism coming from that side. And, and there are reporters that will tell you, oh, if I've made both sides mad, you know, I've done something right. Um, I don't usually uh, agree with that, but I will today. Um, it's the comfort I shall take. Um, and I think it allows us to start with a little bit of middle ground uh, in this tough, tough issue, uh, which I think both sides that are represented uh, here tonight can agree that I'm not smart enough to handle the issue. So we start with that, and uh, I won't be offended by that. Uh, I also learned just now, though, that, that both uh, intelligent design and Darwinian evolution allows for water skiing because both of our guests are accomplished water skiers. So, you know, we're not all so different. Um, we uh, uh, talked a little bit before we came out here about how to start, so there's no big surprise here on my questions. Um, and um, again, we're not trying to um, pull any fast ones or get anybody on the hot seat and uh, try to get the conversation going. And one of the things I found in trying to write about this issue is it's very difficult to summarize intelligent design. Um, partly because it's complicated, partly because it's controversial, and newspapers don't have a lot of room. We don't, we get a paragraph or two to say this is what it is, not books to say what it is. So that's a difficult thing, and I must say the uh, advocates, the promoters of intelligent design don't usually agree with how it comes out in the newspaper. So I wanted to start, see, with giving you the opportunity to tell me and all of us, if you were charged with that, if you had a paragraph or two to explain intelligent design to newspaper readers, not to scientific readers or anybody else, how would you do it? Uh, David, thank you. And uh, thanks to Peter for joining us and for all of you for coming. Um, the, well, I'll, I'll give you our straight up definition and then maybe uh, there's time I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why we might have objected a bit as to the way you portrayed us. Sure. But I, uh, I do appreciate the, the question so directly. Um, the theory of intelligent design holds that there are certain features of the universe and of living systems that are best explained by an intelligent cause rather than an undirected natural process. And so what do we mean by that? And that's, 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 that's our, our so short synopsis. we got synopsis. one paragraph. Okay. Now, what, what the right. second one? That was only a sentence. Okay. okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, the kind of features we're talking about are things that have been discovered in science over the last half century. The, uh, the fine-tuning of the laws of physics and chemistry in the, in the area of physics. The, the exquisite nanotechnology that has been discovered inside cells, the miniature machines, the engines, the sliding clamps, the, uh, uh, the, the, pr the protein copy machines, and, uh, and, and little rotary engines. If you got our little handout as you walked in, you can see some of the, the, the kinds of things that interest us in that regard. And then thirdly, the most interesting thing to me personally is the discovery of the reams and reams of digital code that is in, that's stored inside uh, DNA and transmitted in RNA. And th these are features that we think are best explained by an intelligent cause rather than a purely undirected process. Now, in, in saying that, it's important to understand what we're not saying. We're not necessarily challenging the idea of evolution per se, at least as defined as change over time or even common ancestry. But we are challenging the specifically Darwinian idea that life is the result of a purely undirected process that mimics the powers of a designing intelligence, 
A couple, uh, about a year ago, Richard Dawkins was here from Oxford University. Dawkins is famous for saying that biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. We take the opposite view. We think that things really were designed. They, didn't just, they don't just appear to be designed. And we think that the, the scientific evidence supports that conclusion. My editor's here, and if I could write paragraphs that long, I think we could all agree I could get it down. <laughs> and this is the problem. Uh, Peter, let me ask you, if you can put aside just for this, this, this exercise your feelings about this, the debate and everything else, if you had to explain to your students what it is that Steve promotes, what it is that he, 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 he supports, how would you describe this? Dogma. <laughs> uh, where were you all on my last book tour? <laughs> uh, hopefully I'm seeing some of you, some of my Biology 354 people next Monday. I'm the other guy after Ray. I'm the second half of the Ray and Peter duo. And if you're here, thank you. Um, let me know your name. I really, I like Steve a lot, and I really worry about what intelligent design is doing to our country, it's doing to our kids. What worries me most is this whole idea that we should teach the controversy. It sounds so overtly reasonable. But first off, you have to realize that anything that George Bush is pushing, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Now, wait a minute. Peter, hold on a sec. Peter, a couple of minutes ago, though, you were concerned about this becoming a political issue. And let's just let the record show you're the first one to bring up George Bush. Let me, let me bring you back just a little bit to this. Okay, I this want, is my I, microphone. This is a political issue. It is, so, and that's why I'm here, clearly. But, but, but let's, let's briefly look at the aspect of letting our kids have a science class where we give equal time to evolution and intelligent design. I, Patrick, where are you? I'm going to stop you, though, for a second. Oh. I, want, I want you to try to, and it's not a debate, but I, let's try to answer that question. Is there a way that you can just try to explain this concept, this theory? It's not a theory. That's the thing. It's not science. It's not a theory. So I can't explain it as a theory. I can explain it as a political dogma. Okay. Then, then, Steve, let me go back to you for a second. Let's, you said if given the time you would critique how I described it. Um, and in the story today, which was for a newspaper story kind of long, there's, it's, it's done in little bits and pieces, frankly. We don't put it all in one. But in general, intelligent design argues that life is so biologically complex, there must be some kind of supernatural designer involved. The concept, however, leaves the designer unnamed. What, what's, what's wrong with that piece? I feel your pain, first of all, because I've written op-eds, and I know how hard it is to, to squeeze these things in a few words. But here's why we quibble with your definition. Uh, when we argue for design, we're not arguing based on um, a, a negative assessment of the powers of various naturalistic mechanisms, uh, natural selection, for example. It's not just a critique of natural selection. This is so complex, natural selection couldn't produce it, therefore it was designed. That's not our argument. We do critique the relevant naturalistic uh, hypotheses as to their explanatory power with respect to, for example, these exquisite machines or circuits in cells, or I think even more importantly, the digital code in cells. But we're also making a positive case for design based upon our knowledge, not our ignorance, but our knowledge of the cause and effect structure of the world. It is part of our knowledge that there is a cause that is sufficient to produce digital code. We know that that cause is intelligence uh, from our own experience. We, uh, Bill Gates, for example, has said that DNA is like a software program, uh, only much more complex than any that's ever been written. Now, we know from experience that when you build things that function like software code, inevitably there's a mind or an intelligence involved. When I was doing my doctoral work in Cambridge, I was very much interested in whether or not this, this new argument from design could be made into a rigorous scientific argument. Uh, Peter and I both have a background in historical sciences and in, in paleontology, geology. And, it, and I went back to the source, to Darwin and to his mentor, Lyell. And the key methodological maxim that they, they enjoined upon historical scientists was a, a very much common sense idea, which is that if you're trying to explain the past, you shouldn't invent exotic causes of the, of, of, of the sort we've never seen in operation, but rather you should invoke causes that are known to produce the effect in, in question. And Lyell's 
way of framing that was to say we should, we should be looking for cause, pre presently acting causes. Well, I asked the question, what's the presently acting cause of digital code? We know of only one, that's intelligence. So we're not arguing from our ignorance of cause and effect process, but rather our knowledge of okay. it. Well, Peter, how do you, if we can try to stick to that, I'm obviously handicapped because I'm not an actim. I'm not a biologist, a paleontologist. You are. So if you can respond to that on my behalf, how would you? What is, what is, what is the, the scientific argument well, against, well, against that? We really need position. to, first of all, I think a nice thing to do right to begin here is instead of asking what is life, what is science? Science is not an assemblage of facts, truth, not capital T, truth. Scientists test things. And so a way that I would approach and have approached this idea about intelligent design is ask the question, which you can also ask of evolutionary biology, what set of data that you could find would totally convince you you're absolutely wrong? And I could pose this to Stephen. I know what I would do. If I could go out and I would find a dinosaur fossil with a human head in the jaws of a T-Rex, I guarantee I would not be accepting evolutionary biology in its current guise because we would know that is an absolutely falsifiable set of findings that makes what we understand, what we teach, and the, the set of many, many, many hypotheses and theories that make up evolutionary biology. It's not just one. If I were to find that, or if I were to go back to the Devonian or the Ordovician and find a monkey sitting among those Ordovician brachiopods, we have made a big mistake. Now, I ask you that. What set of findings would make convince you that ID, as you understand it, has been falsified? Uh, that's a good question. I'd say one thing as a preamble. If we found that, we'd, all, we'd both end up being young Earth creationists, the thing about the, <laughs> you know. The, but uh, uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I hold to the older. You're an older Earth creationist. I, I'm, well, whatever you want to call it. Thank you. Um, uh, I think uh, science, uh, first of all, I think the theory of intelligent design is eminently testable. It's but, not a theory, but, though. Uh, well, I think it is. Uh, I think it's testable by, uh, by, in the same way that Darwin's theory of evolution was testable, in the, way, in the same way that Darwin set out to, to test his theory, which was against uh, a suite of different evidences. He, said the, he listed these different classes of facts that supported his argument for, for example, universal common descent. Um, there, I don't think theories are tested by one silver bullet experiment. I think that's, it's usually a weighing of the preponderance of evidence. So I, I, I wouldn't accept the way you framed your question. But I think there are a number of key tests of intelligent design. All historical theories are tested in two ways. The first is in their, in their ability to explain already known facts. This is critical in the, in the Darwinian synthesis. It's not that, because we are unable to, uh, to replicate the past under controlled laboratory experiments, historical scientists are often put in the position of having to uh, explain already known facts, and the way you test a theory is by comparing its explanatory power against its nearest competitor. Some of the key things that I put on the table at the beginning of the discussion, the, the presence of this, this nanotechnology in cells, the presence of information, I think uh, intelligent design has already been tested because it is capable What is that of, test? The, the test? The test is, uh, is what theory best explains the information embedded in DNA, uh, where best is determined by what we know about the cause and effect structure of the world. And what we, when, when uh, I mean, you and I both have a, a fascination with these experiments, the RNA world experiments. And what we find there is that the, the hottest theory of the origin of life, the, that is the, uh, the, the naturalistic uh, alternative to intelligent design, is relying heavily on so-called uh, ribozyme engineering the attempt to get RNA molecules to perform certain uh, 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 tasks Stephen, of you, you proteins. haven't answered my question. What, is that the test you're going to do? Is the, right the, the, the key test is uh, uh, show me a process that generates information and large amounts of specified information without the guidance of an intelligent agent. These ribozyme engineering, uh, this ribozyme engineering work that I know you, you are so interested in as, I, as am I, is guided by intelligence. Such, such benefits, such improvements in the, uh, the efficiency of, of replication, for example, that are achieved, and so far they're fairly minimal, are achieved because an intelligent agent is guiding that. That is a, if, so I say those experiments are actually simulating the power of intelligence, and only, and everything we know is that only intelligence produces information. So we test our theories against our knowledge of the cause and effect structure right. of the world. I want, to, I want to let Peter get, but let me add one follow-up to you. Do you believe that intelligent design 
has faced as rigor, rigorous a scientific test as Darwinian evolution? I mean, are they equal in terms of being put to the test? I think, first of all, there are many things that Darwinian evolution can explain. Okay. Uh, but there are some very key things that Darwinian evolution, and in particular, chemical evolutionary theory of the origin of the first life, cannot and has not explained. And I used to ask my students, um, if you want to give your, your, uh, your computer a new functionality, what do you have to give it? And the answer is, you have to give it new lines of code. The same thing is true in life. And so the, the fact that, that uh, these evolutionary theories have not been able to explain the origin of the first information is not a minor anomaly. This is a fundamental theory, a, a theoretical problem. It's a fundamental lacuna. Any theory that can't account for the origin of information when, when we now understand that information runs the show in biology is a theory that has a serious theoretical gap. Okay, equal time, equal yeah, time. Please. <sighs> He's just so smooth, though. I could sit Sorry, back and I'll, listen I'll slow for... down. Uh, one of the beautiful things about science is it's predictive. And the biological theories that we call evolution, there are so many, predict many things. And they also produce things. Now, one of the great predictive aspects of this body of knowledge that we call evolutionary theory is that it is our first line of defense against something that I think affects every one of us, infectious disease. We know that viruses mutate. We know that bacteria evolve. We have to stay one step ahead of that. And I would suggest that all who really, if you really believe in intelligent design, you're not allowed to use antibiotics. Um, that's, that's not true. <laughs> it's forever taken away from you. You're not allowed to have this stuff. So my point here, Steve, is what can, what is the predictive power that ID can do? What will it predict and what will it produce? Because what evolutionary theory has done has ended up an enormous number of predictions that have had huge power and have actually had material production. What can ID do along those lines? That's a great question. Let me give a couple examples. Um, for a few, few of you may have grabbed our handout on the way in. Um, you may know that there's an ongoing debate about the origin of the molecular machines in the cell, the bacterial flagellar motor, uh, this little rotary engine that Michael Behe has made famous in his book, Darwin's Black Box. He's been a, um, uh, critiqued by Ken Miller, a biologist at Brown University. Uh, Behe's at Lehigh. It looks for all the world like a scientific debate. Um, Miller has noted that there's a little uh, syringe-like uh, pump that has many of the same protein parts that make up a bacterial flagellar motor. Miller argues that that syringe is uh, an ancestral form of the flagellar motor. Behe argues that it's a degenerative uh, product of the genetic information that made the motor as a whole. Now, th th that leads, that's a chicken or egg question, which came first? And that's a very testable question. Which of those two systems is older? Which is younger? And papers are beginning to come in on this, one by Milton Sayer recently, uh, actually favoring Behe's position, although somewhat tentatively. Uh, my colleague Scott Minnick at the University of Idaho, a microbiologist, is doing a number of, of experiments to test this very thing. We think there's very strong evidence that the flagellar motor is ancestral, or uh, yeah, that the, the motor as a whole and the genes that made it are ancestral, and that the, the um, uh, the, the type 3 secretory system, as it's called, is a, is a, is a, is a byproduct of that and, and derivative of that. For one thing, the, the, uh, the, the genes for building the type 3 secretory system occur on little plasmids that are derivative from other genomes. Uh, there's several cases of this, but it's all the, the same conclusion. So it's very simple. There's an argument. There's a critical test. Which is, which is younger, which is older? There's a number of ways to test that, phylogenetic studies and so forth. Michael Behe's ID theory is very testable. Okay, let's go back and let me ask the question again. I see why he's got such a pretty face. It's like Muhammad Ali. He <laughs> dodges and weaves. This is great. Um, tell me what, what are the predictive powers of ID? What can it give us? If it's a scientific theory, there will be predictions that accrue. What well, are they going to be? Well, I just made one, first of but all. Secondly, really... I'll give a couple others. Okay. okay. Uh, when, we, when we talked last on, was it Dory, right? Dory Monson? Dory okay. Monson. Uh, I talked about the, the whole issue of junk DNA. Okay. There are two very important papers that have come out in the last year saying that neo-Darwinism has been heuristically unfruitful with respect to the whole question of these non-coding oh, regions of the heuristically genome. Heuristically unfruitful. It's exactly what you're asking about. Okay. What, you know, has it made good predictions that have led us to new discoveries or has it led us down a blind alley? Conclusion, 
uh, James Shapiro, Richard von Sternberg, it's led us down a blind alley. It says, neo-Darwinism says, hey, if, uh, you know, observes that there's big sections of the genome that don't code for proteins, because we assume that genetic is in information is produced by a trial and error process, uh, then we would assume that there would be a lot of so-called junk DNA. That was the, the first conclusion Crick drew in, the, in 1980 about it. Well, it's turning out that there's lots of hidden functions in that non-coding region, which is exactly something that we would predict from a design theoretic point of view because we don't think information was produced by a higgledy-piggledy tri trial and error process. But couldn't that as easily just be the fact that science is now getting better and better in understanding the huge complexity of DNA? Science is not truth. We're adding information all the time, and we're constantly changing ideas and hypotheses. I, I, I mean, this that, idea yeah. of junk DNA, it was called junk DNA because a generation ago, the people looking at this had not had a very poor understanding of how things work at that particular level, and there's less and less junk in that DNA now. But this, this is not the, something The theoretical framework predicts. of Darwinism did lead us down to bl a blind alley, but let me, let me give you another example. What is My Darwinism? Colleague, well, uh, it's the... Uh, let, let me give you another example rather than define terms that... Yeah, I don't know what Darwinism is, though. Uh, it's the synthetic theory of, yeah. Um, what, what, tell me, just, can you define Darwinism? We should, we, and we should, I want to talk about it, but let, let well, I want to answer his main, answer, his main finish, question finish about predictive answer, but then let's talk about that. Go ahead. A couple years ago, Bruce Alberts had an article in Cell saying that to be effective cell biologists in the, in the age of molecular machines, we need, to be tra we need to be training our students as design engineers. And uh, my colleague Jonathan Wells has, has taken that up with some seriousness, and he says, I'm inter he's interested in a particular form of cancer. He has a hypothesis about what has caused it. And he is applying principles of design engineering to understand the, the functioning of centrioles. He hypothesizes that they are functioning on the same principles of turbines. They not only look like turbines, but they actually are turbines. He's had a Boeing engineer help him work up some of the, the mathematical calculations. And he's now able to explain some of the effects that may be responsible for a particular form of cancer. So he's using an explicitly designed theoretic framework to guide his research into, in, 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 in hopes that we discover some, some, some new things that but we wouldn't you, have otherwise. You've lost me. How does that relate to intelligent design? He's, he's treating, he's not just saying, as a, as a Darwinian would do, things look designed, but they're not really designed. He says, no, they really are designed, so I'm going to apply principles of mechanical engineering to try to, to guide my search for other uh, unknown structures in the cell. He's using design as a positive guide to discovery. Peter, can I ask a question? Uh, I didn't think it was that hard to understand. I don't know. I missed, I missed it. Draw a distinction between uh, evolution, Darwinian evolution, and now we, we also heard the phrase neo-Darwinianism. Do you see those distinctions? Do those mean something to you? Well, there's a lot of ways to, I guess, put things in boxes. Um, what we call evolutionary biology is composed of a huge number now of interesting, testable hypotheses. And what is a theory? A theory is simply a hypothesis that has withstood so many different tests that it is rather a next layer up. It's certainly not a truth with a capital T. Uh, we have so many aspects of studying what we call evolutionary biology. My particular way of looking at it is examining the fossil record and to explicitly test ideas and hypotheses. Uh, one of the really interesting things to me, and, and in a major sense, one of the things that I do mostly is I study extinction. Now, it seems to me that a major test of ID, if that designer is so damn good, why is it that 99% of all species ever produced or extinct? I mean, that's really crappy design. Yeah. Why is it that I'm turning into such old age so fast. I mean, that's crappy design, too. And I'm, I'm really pissed at the designer on that little deal. Um, if, if we try to call something Darwinism, a lot of us object to that because it is really one of the ways that you can do this is stand up this sort of cardboard thing we call Darwinism, and then what the ID people try to do is knock it down. And if it's knocked down, then what's standing? Well, I mean, the ID people will tell you it's ID. But again, science is a very different thing than knocking down cardboard cutouts. I think if you look at any of the web tracking devices of science and you type in keywords and you ask how many articles, comments, references are there to any aspect of evolution, it's in the hundreds of thousands to millions. Now, you do the same thing on intelligent design in the scientific literature, and you're in the hundreds. 
This is good. This, Steve, this is what I was trying to ask you earlier. Do you think that intelligent design has been put to the same test? You have 100 years of research and debate and, and, and questions uh, and challenges to one theory, and you have, I don't know how much on the other side, but a decade of, of real work on that well, side? Uh, I mean, they're uh, not, they can't uh, be yes, equal, can yeah, they? Yeah, certainly this is a new theory. I mean, you know, the... It's not a theory. Um, <laughs> is that, is that a, an applause line, really? I mean, that's... Um, uh, cer certainly, it's a new theory, but the, the, re the reason that we—he's uh, allowed to call it a look, theory. Look, the, we, we have on our—we have on our website, uh, uh, you know, a list of the peer-reviewed articles and books that have been published. There's some significant work going on here. Uh, some of it published with mainstream university uh, presses. Are they in the tens, and, the hundreds? Uh, in the tens. In the tens. Significant books. Uh, uh, when Darwin's theory of evolution was but published, evolution in is in the millions now. Well, but right. there are also accumulating anomalies for the theory that have been that have been building up over a century. And you know, there's the, the, the same literature that discusses evolution also discuss, discusses the significant problems with it. I want to go back to the, the, the challenge that was raised. You know, are we erecting a, a cardboard cutout of Darwinian evolution, or is there a reason we use the term neo-Darwinism? There is. Evolution can mean many different things. Uh, I've written an essay called The Meanings of Evolution. I've identified at least six different meanings. Uh, many other people who write in the area would agree. But three key meanings. It can mean change over time. It can mean uh, the common ancestry or the idea of universal common ancestry, Darwin's tree of life, picture of the history of life. And it can also mean, it can refer to a mechanism, and specifically the idea that natural selection acting on various forms of, of mutations is sufficient to produce the form and function that we see around us and the appearance of design. Now, when we use the term neo-Darwinism, we do so because we want to be, be clear about what we're challenging and what we're not. In, in challenging, um, the theory of intelligent design does not challenge the first two meanings of evolution, change over time or the idea of common ancestry, though some of us are skeptical about universal common ancestry. But it does specifically challenge the idea that a purely undirected process, natural selection acting on random variations or other similarly materialistic mechanisms can account for the for all the form that we see in, in the biological world. So we're not, we're not trying to be, uh, erect a stereotype of the theory and knock it down, just the opposite. We're trying to be clear and, and precise about what we are critiquing and what we're not. I saw uh, Peter jump when you said there are people who question the universal an ancestry. What, 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 what goes through your head when you heard that? Well, I personally, um, I have my own sense about, I'm really interested in the origin of life, not just on this planet, but on any planet. And I suspect that we're going to really understand that there are more, many more kinds of life that can be built. In my recent book, book plug moment, Life as We Do Not Know It, I really do attempt to think about, gee, if it's not DNA life, what could it be? And if it's not our kind of DNA life, could, and it turns out there'd be a variety of ways you can make DNA. And there's a fabulous evolutionist at University of Florida, Florida Steve Benner, who invented a DNA that uses a different language. The language of DNA is using a series of bases to spell out, I want to use this amino acid or this amino acid to build a protein. We're all made of proteins. Well, he made a DNA that uses a different language, totally f fake DNA. And he uses it to help us survive those of us afflicted with hepatitis B. And he's a multimillionaire from this. He changed. He was God. He changed the nature of the basic stuff of life using evolutionary Some principles. Brilliant design engineering. It certainly was. <laughs> and he used it to help kill off a highly undesigned but very bad bug. It, it, thank you. <laughs> Can I say something about those bad bugs? I think this they are is, bad bugs. They are bad. We agree on that. We agree on a lot. This is yeah, funny. Um, the, the, I have a colleague, Scott Minnick, who works on pathogenic things, bad stuff. And it turns out that this flagellar motor that Mike Behe has made so much of is very important in understanding the origin of, of pathogenicity and some of the, like, the plague and other things. And what Minnick has discovered is that... This, that um, uh, that a number of these bad critters, these bad, these bad things that are excreted that cause the plague and other, uh, other um, killer diseases, 
are the result of mutational degradation of a clearly aboriginal design, the original genome that builds the bacterial flagellar motor. So what the hell was your designer thinking when he made the plague? Well, th the point is that the plague was not part of the aboriginal design. You asked a minute ago about extinctions. I mean, everything that we designed, the fact that, that things... Who's we? Is that the royal we? We. <laughs> oh, okay. You, know, you and I are kind of pointy it. heads. Maybe we don't design much at all. We just talk for a living. But uh, the... the <clears throat> The, the point is that, that humans design things and eventually they, de they decay. Uh, and so the fact that there are extinctions or the fact that there are mutations that degrade original designs that are good but then cause harm to us is, is not a, a problem to design theory. That's something that you would expect. Is that your answer? That, you know, Peter asked earlier about, you know, he feels like he's getting old, so he's angry at the designer. How, how do you, I mean, is that sort of the why do good things happen to bad people argument? What do you say if there is a designer, supreme designer, who figured this out, how do you answer those sorts of questions that well, Peter raised? The, the question is parasitic off of the theological assumption. That what? It means that... <laughs> I'm glad you said that. I don't know. Tell me, explain. The question is parasitic off of a theological assumption. <laughs> it, it's, it's borrowing something from theology, namely okay. the, the assumption behind the question is if, if there is a, an intelligent designer, then why isn't everything perfect? Okay. Yeah. Now, if, if you, we're looking at this as scientists and saying, you know, there's certain key hallmarks of intelligent activity. One of them is information. One of them is the, is the functional integration of parts that perform a function. He calls that irreducible complexity. So we, we infer to an intelligence. Um, now, people want to say, well, why didn't the intelligence do it this way, that way, or the other? Well, to answer that question, you get immediately into theology if you're thinking that the, the, the designer is God. If you're thinking that the designer is not God, uh, is, that it's some kind of intelligence, the identity of which we know not, um, then, then those problems don't really arise. Either way, uh, the, the theologians have answers for those questions. They say, you know, God didn't see fit to make us immortal because uh, we're prideful and we're not, we're not ready for that. Uh, uh, that's a theological answer. In other words, whether you take a theological perspective on design or whether you just take a generic understanding of design built from analogy to our own experience as designers, we have reasons to expect that you would see evidence of design but also evidence of decay. So the fact of, of extinction is, is I, I don't think, a decisive argument against design. So, Stephen, who is this or what is this designer in your view? In, in my view, the, the designer is God. Okay, but uh, David, David's point, I don't know if our guys at Discovery hit you about this or not, but, but how do we, how do we test for God? Science can not I'm not saying we God. can test for, I'm not saying but we can test for God. Then ID can't but, be a science, I, but, because you, we can test for the process. Well, you've, made, you've made a jump in logic. You've made a jump in logic. No, you've made a jump in logic. You can test for intelligence. Hold, hold on, hold okay. on, we'll get to okay. questions later. Give us a chance. I wonder if we could give that heckler a round of applause for making the evening more memorable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, no, uh, no. Whatever you clear, say, we're, we're not going to box. We like each other. Yeah. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> but if you're here for red meat, I'm sorry. We're vegetarians. We're vegetarians. <laughs> um, let me address this in context of what David wrote this morning. Okay. The theory of intelligent design holds that an intelligent cause can explain. It's not a theory can explain certain things. Okay, and the reason that we say that is that there are certain key features in, based on our cause and effect structure of the world that we know only intelligence can build. One of those is digital code. So when we find digital code in the cell, we think that it is a warranted inference to, to infer that there was a prior intelligence. Now, we don't claim to be able to know from the scientific evidence the identity of the designer. The, the scientific methods of design detection that have been developed by people like William Dembski in his book Design Inference with Cambridge Press enable us to infer to an intelligence. We do this all the time, by the way. If you're an archaeologist and you see inscriptions in the Rosetta Stone, you infer that it was a scribe, not wind and erosion. Um, there, are, there are criteria that enable us to detect intelligent cause. Except and with the Rosetta Stone, and we know who, who the me, author me, was. We know that it was a, me, a human me, carving. Me, Give me, me one second, Peter. The, the, Which point, is just, the point is we're not, claiming, we're not claiming from the scientific evidence to be able to know that the designer is God. I understand. Okay? But from so, a, it's a, it's a, so Peter's made a jump here, when, it's saying that ID is not testable. We're not claiming the thing he says is, is not testable. We're only claiming that... The, that the presence of an intelligence versus an undirected process is detectable and testable with okay. scientific Peter's methods. Peter's going to blow a course, I, so let's let him talk. I believe in punctuated equilibrium. Thank you. So Peter, so so Peter, so Peter what do you make of the Cambrian explosion? Do you, do you hold uh -huh. a polyphyletic or a monophyletic view of the history of life? 
You know, I was hoping we'd get to that, and one of the really wonderful things that we do compare is Cambrian Explosion. Uh, I've been up to the Burgess Shale, and one of the real interesting things about the Burgess Shale is that the damn Canadians control it so tightly. Are there any Canadians here? <laughs> <laughs> A little too late now hey, on that I was, one. I was a landed immigrant. <laughs> Richard Nixon was not going to kill me. But I came back, and what I'd like you to know is I've been up to the, the Burgess Shale, and what happened there is that you have to carry out all your own wastes. So all the scientists who go up there get a tin can with your name on it. So anything that you produce, you bring back down out there with you. Steve Gould was up there, and not only did he have to carry out his own waste, he had to be carried up on a sedan chair and came back again. But it's an amazing place for understanding, I mean, this view of life and this grandeur of life. Now, what's so spectacular is the Burgess Shale was really thought to be the only window, the only real window into the past so we could get soft-parted creatures. But a fantastic new place, as you know, Chengjiang in China, we now have another window 10 million years prior to the Burgess. The same sort of preservation where not only the fossils, not only their hard parts, but soft parts are preserved. And lo and behold, they're less evolved than the Burgess. It's a two-part snapshot. If you ever want the most fabulous reaffirmation that evolution took place, you just look at the Burgess and look at Chengjiang. And I think you have a tremendous sense of a tree going back towards its roots. Evolution is writ large in almost biblical proportions, excuse me, if you go out and look at the rock record. I, I disagree with the assessment. I've also been to the top. We got a big kick out of it. My, I took my son. Oh, and, your, and your he, cans? He, yeah, <laughs> well, the fact that we made it back down and Steve Gould had to be airlifted <laughs> off. You know, we <laughs> did. Uh, but uh, it, a couple of years ago, we sponsored one of the leading uh, Chinese paleontologists in your, in your department to come speak in your department, uh, J.Y. Chen. And uh, uh, I, I, I dispute your assessment that you have lesser complexity at the base of the explosion. The, the Chengjiang fossils are beautifully preserved. Oh, they are. The, and you have trilobites. Where they've now discovered fishes there in... Yeah, there's but what I'm saying, they're less... Either. The lobopods, for instance. We used to go into lobopods. You've got far more, far more complex in the Burgess than your Chengjiang. You, Evolution has increased diversity. It has increased you, complexity. You have, this, you have some animals that are less complex because they weren't known before. No, okay, but, trust but, me on this, Stephen. The, trust me on this. The, Tr no, you no, can't don't, trust don't me on this, right? I've written on this, too. No, 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 no. Uh, no, 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 no. You can't so, go there with it. Anyway, J.Y. Uh, Chen is at your department, and he doesn't accept the tree picture. He says it's upside down. You get the major diversification, major innovation of form right from the base of the Cambrian. <laughs> and uh, it's not an argument. That's a gesture. No in case you've not taken logic. Uh, and uh, afterwards, he was, uh, he's, very, he's very skeptical of of uh, uh, universal common descent. Yes, that's one. And now I can cite a hundred who absolutely and, uh, disagree he with was him. Asked, he, he was asked, uh, uh, you're, you're, so, you're so skeptical about, about the standard Darwinian doctrine of universal common descent. And he said, well, in my country, he says, you can question Darwin, but you can't question the government. He says, in this country, you can question the government, but you can't question Darwinism. Now, <laughs> let's... All right. I want to... Uh, I want to go. What's Darwinism? Well, we, I the, think we've the been through that. conjunct of universal common descent and the theory of natural selection and random mutation. I think we've been through that. Let me let me go back to God for a second, since some folks at Discovery think I'm obsessed with a question. Here's what's difficult for me to wrap my head around, and and I think Peter was, was going to this. If if the designer is unnamed, but nearly all the advocates say that in their religious view it's God. But that's not a scientific view. I mean, there's very few advocates of intelligent design who, who name a designer other than God, correct? Um, there are a few that, that uh, are religiously agnostic, like Michael Denton, or the Buddhist Jeffrey Schwartz, the neuroscientist at, University of, uh, at UCLA, uh, Berlinski, who is sympathetic to design but not a proponent, uh, is, is agnostic religiously. So uh, the, and, and I think some interesting other examples, not from our camp, but uh, from the evolutionary world of evolutionary biology would be people like uh, uh, Fred Hoyle, Chandra Wickramasinghe, and even Francis Crick, who speculated that life had been designed and transported here from right. outer space, the so-called panspermia theory. So uh, there are other options. And that's, that's one of the 
we're not trying to be sneaky. I think one of the things we objected to about your article is it kind of it slightly hinted that we were being disingenuous no, in this. And maybe you didn't mean that. I, don't, I certainly didn't mean disingenuous. Some people but, have said it directly. You but, guys are being sneaky. Yeah, no, and, no, and, and well, the judge said it. We were. The being judge sneaky. said it in yeah. Dover. But uh, we're just it, trying to. It's, it's the opposite, though, David. We're just trying to be careful about what the science says, what it imp implies, what it points to. Yeah, am I going to separate you two? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but let me just. I'll, yeah. I'll give you a chance we on this computer. We see evidence of an intelligence. But it is a second-order philosophical question as to the nature and identity of that in intelligence. When you see gene sequences that function like software code, you can see but, but mine you is understand at work, how people but, but there's no signature. There's, there, there's, there, there's, it doesn't say made by anyone. I understand, but you have the, the majority of the fellows say God is the designer. You have funders who have openly stated religious uh, uh, positions and agendas and, and, and promote that. And it really becomes a small little piece of middle ground then to say it's been designed, we're not going to say by who. The people with the money, the people getting the money have, have an answer to that. It just seems like a shrinking piece well, to try to, to maintain sure. the non-named designer, right? We're interested in evidence and arguments, okay? And we think the evidence strongly supports the reality of a prior designing intelligence. We don't go further in identifying the design on the test basis that? of science. How do you test that? In How some do of the ways that I mentioned previously. Science cannot test the supernatural. And that's what it you're having. Test it for cannot test for the supernatural. It. Science just cannot deal with what you want it to go. If Therefore, it is not science. If your argument was true, Peter, then we would not be able to test the conclusion that the Rosetta Stone had been made by an intelligent agent rather than a, a wind and erosion. Oh, that's crap. Uh, <laughs> we... we <clears throat> I, that, that, again, was not an argument. Um, the, the point is we test our inferences about the past against our knowledge of the cause and effect structure of the world. We know from experience that intelligence produces information. When we find information on the Rosetta Stone, we therefore infer that an, uh, uh, there was an intelligent cause at work. That's, that, is, that is testable against the backdrop of our knowledge of cause and effect experience. I see Joe Felsenstein in the audience, probably one of the world's greatest evolutionists, and I see him... Well, I should see his expressions. Uh, I, I would love that if Joe could come up here, I guess he can't, and talk to us about your comment about intelligence and this digital code business. From my own point of view, you're going on. Joe! No, no, that's okay. The next one. It, it, it seems to me that digital code is one of the things that I study. I study the appearance and the disappearance of things. So when I look at the fossil record, it really is a digital yes, no. It's around for a while, then it goes extinct. And so I'm looking at terminations, presence, absence, presence, absence. That's a whole digital code. It's got nothing to do with intelligence. And yet here is this beautiful pattern. Where it is coming from is extinction or not of extinction based on adaptations of organisms. AID has nothing to do with this. Well, you, this is simply natural selection and extinction and sometimes meteors from space. And unless your designer is throwing the damn meteors, then how do you account for this? I'm talking about the digital code in DNA. You're confusing that with a, no, a digital a, a, code, an analytical pattern. You are saying you there's might... no biological pattern of digital code that is not produced by an intelligence. I just gave you one. That, 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 that's not functional information. That's your well, description. It's real information. That's your description of, of the pattern in the fossil record. And we have, you, you, what's wrong you, with my description? Are, I think are, it's, I'm sure it's accurate, Peter. That's not the problem. <laughs> we have okay. 10 minutes left. We're, we're talking we talk about, about software. We teach the or controversy. Stuff that functions like yes, software. Let's talk about teaching the controversy, Peter. Thank you. Okay. And what, Peter, we'll, let me start with you. Uh, uh, is there a controversy over Dar Darwinian evolution? Um, there are so many controversies within evolutionary biology. I mean, where do I start? We have, everywhere we look are controversies, but there are controversies in every science. There are thousands of controversies in physics or in chemistry or in any field of biology. Why do we single out evolutionary biology the fact that we have controversies, just like Cobb County, Georgia, we put a little sticker on it, let's single out evolution. The fact that we have controversies somehow makes us less legitimate as a science. That's what science is. It is nothing but controversies. Why do we single out? So I, I have a nine-year-old. Patrick Ward, are you here? Patrick, or did you go home? There he is. Check that out. He's wore a tie for the first time ever today for this. Okay, my son Patrick Ward is in a Seattle public school. He has science. 
When you're teaching nine-year-olds, you don't really, you can't teach science. Science is a verb, it is not a noun. I think that's really important. Science is a verb. And all we have time to teach in middle school are facts that science has come up with. But we can't teach how to do science in a middle school or a grade school. Now, they want to teach the controversy. How in the world, when you can't even teach real science in a grade school, are you going to have a nine-year-old like Patrick Ward try to balance a political point of view with a very complex methodological construct? One of the greatest the human mind has ever come up with, which is this verb we call science, it can't be done. If we teach the controversy, we remove the amount of time that Patrick Ward gets to hear about really important things, like biology, like DNA, like astronomy, and we put it in the realm of politics. We change a science class to a politics class. Now, let's say that every public school in America, as these folks want, teaches intelligent design, politics, next to science. What are American students like? How do they compete with the Chinese? How do they compete with the Europeans and the Japanese who don't do this? What do we do if we tell students the answer to that question is way too complex, forget about it, we kill curiosity? This will be my only heat of this point. Intelligent design taught in our schools will kill curiosity. And we become a nation of second raters. Okay. Think about this. Steve, can you, th there's been controversy even about what does it mean to teach can, controversy. What does it mean when, when Discovery Institute says that? Um, I don't think teaching, uh, first of all, one thing Peter and I agree about is that, I, that uh, science is full of controversies. And our proposal for science education, which I've made um, with my uh, Darwinist colleague, fa former UW professor John Angus Campbell, is that teaching arguments and What's competing Darwinist? Ar key, uh, teaching arguments in science is a very good way to teach science because one of the things that scientists do, one of the most important things that scientists do, is they argue about competing interpretations of the same evidence. And uh, in, in Darwin's book, um, in The Origin of Species, Darwin says that he's making one long argument. And contemporary neo-Darwinism, which is indeed a biological perspective, uh, makes uh, many of the same arguments, but they're updated. And it turns out if you survey the biological literature, whether you're talking about the evidence from the fossil record, the evidence of molecular or anatomical homology, the evidence from biogeography, the evidence for the uh, causal efficacy of natural selection acting on random mutation, there are evidence-based counter-arguments to most of the main arguments that, that are made in the, in the neo-Darwinian synthesis. So what we, we think that this, is, this doesn't kill curiosity, this it opens the door to but curiosity. But it does, it says it's so complex. No. no. And, and another, another thing that, that, that uh, I mean, you, you have, we're, we're, by the way, we're not advocating that the theory of intelligent design be required in the public schools. We're trying to develop a scientific research program. We funded a lot of research. Most of the, the key books that have been produced in the early phases of work on intelligent design were funded by our institute. Uh, our, our proposal is that students should learn the scientific case for Darwinian evolution in its modern and full glory but they should also learn the, the scientific arguments against the theory as they appear in the scientific literature. The Cambrian explosion is a serious challenge to the idea of a seamless development of life. No, not even you have 40 least. body plans that emerge suddenly in the fossil record. And we can if, do if that, that so the, simply with Hox genes. I teach this one of the lectures That's in my very class. controversial, it's, whether no, Hox genes. Is that's not, exactly no, please, that's Steve, the perfect listen. illustration of what we're saying. Three weeks from now, I'll give that lecture. Please come. I will convert you. It'll be... I, I know about to the Darwin Steve. side. <laughs> My first uh, convert. He's inviting me to join the dark side again. Like, uh, yeah, it's the light side. Look at this suit, yeah, man. Uh, yeah. Let's let uh, the audience ask some questions sure. uh, uh, through me in this case. They, we got, I have three piles, uh, uh, one that are for both of you and then some for, for one or the other. But let's start with some that are for both of you. Um, going for some more common ground. Is there any place where these two ideas intersect? Is there any possibility of both, both of these theories being partly true? Peter? Well, no, there's only one theory, and there's one political ideology, so they can't intersect. 
Now, on the other hand, Steve has done some very good work, and I've actually seen what he has done. He actually has done real science. He worked for a scientific company. He's helped us find petroleum. He's helped in the good old days when gas wasn't three dollars per gallon. Actually, that was the only time I was employed. Was it? it was just as high. You know? <laughs> so he has done science. But the ID side isn't science. It can't intersect. There's no intersection. If one part goes for something supernatural, all of a sudden you're out of the realm of science. I mean, how would you like, how would you like it if we went to a religion class and I started teaching organic chemistry? So, Steve, go ahead. Answer um, the question. Do you see a place where, where these could intersect and they both? Can yeah, be part of course. Of the um, you know, we, I said at the beginning that we don't challenge the idea of change over time. Uh, Peter and I have substantially the same view of the fossil record. Uh, what we uh, we challenge is the idea that there's a purely undirected process driving all that change. So uh, I, here, I had a, something that came across the other day. This was from uh, the Lawrence Livermore Laboratories. It says, uh, evolutionary paths to new therapeutic drugs as a wide assortment of other enzyme products have been created through, of all things, intelligent design. And the headline is intelligently designed molecular evolution. You can have change over time that is is guided or directed by intelligence. What our method of analysis does, following Dembski and others, is enable you to detect the products of intelligence in the, in the, in, in the echo of their effects. That yeah, but scientists don't design and humans can build things. I mean, the pseudomine was intelligently designed, I guess. I mean, but what we do say is that the pattern of life that we see and the way we understand life can be understood through scientific methodology. Well, you're, it you're defining science as excluding intelligent causation by definition, yet that is part of the reality of our experience, that minds produce certain sorts of effects. And what we are seeing is some of those effects in the cell. Let's try to get another question. Uh, I think you disagree on that one. Uh, this is another one for both of you. What is the relationship between evidence and proof? And how does this relationship bear on intelligent design and the scientific community's critique of intelligent design? Let's let Steve answer first this time. Um, I, I think Peter and I will agree on this. That science does not provide us with knockdown, drag out proof in the mode of, uh, say, medieval, philo what medieval philosophers were seeking. Uh, rather, what we have are competing explanations of phenomena. And we usually, in science, try to make an inference to the best explanation, where, where is, again, best is adjudicated by our knowledge of the cause and effect structure of the world. So when I have formulated scientific arguments for the theory of intelligent design, I have done them using the same uh, method of reasoning, the same method of study that Darwin himself used, which was the, sometimes called the method of multiple competing hypotheses in our primary training in geology, or the idea of making an inference to the best explanation. So we're trying to develop our uh, our case for design based on standard methods of scientific reasoning and based on scientific evidence that we observe. Peter, the relationship between evidence and proof. Well, as, as again, uh, there's no capital T. Ben Kerr here, Carl Bergstrom, I was lucky to have just some great colleagues in the last couple of days, and we talked about this. I think I learned more from talking to these guys than having a long time. But science isn't about a capital T truth. I mean, things, look at, we, the, we really thought that we understood the way that physics worked. I mean, we went back to Newton. Newton had explained things so beautifully. And then we had to discard most of it when we understood more, saw more, got more facts. And Einstein came along. And because of this, we had to discard an awful lot of Newtonian mechanics. Science, we could have said, say, in 1700, that we had the truth, capital T, on physics. But science doesn't work that way. Somebody else is going to come along and probably displace Einsteinian business. Things change. But what you cannot do is go to the supernatural, because every aspect of science can only deal with the natural. The supernatural is required for intelligent design. Steve, you guys don't like that phrase, supernatural. Do you? No. Uh, we, we, the, the methods of design detection, and I would encourage people who are, are astute mathematicians and scientists to, to look at uh, Dembski's work and the design inference. Uh, uh, the, the kind of argument that I've constructed from information is based on uh, our knowledge of what intelligent agents do. But what am and, I missing? And so we, we can't, we, we're not claiming to be able to detect a supernatural intelligence, but rather intelligent simpliciter. One of Dembski's key points in the first chapter of the design inference is that we detect the action of intelligence all the time in cryptography, in forensic science, in archaeology, in anthropology, in, even in, in uh, trade fields like uh, 
uh, insurance fraud detection, we are able, minds are able to recognize the products of other minds. That's part of being a rational individual. And what Peter is suggesting is that we should exclude from science the possibility of intelligent causation as a methodological principle. When we want to be open to wherever the, lev the evidence leads, we think science is about seeking the truth, no holds barred, and being open to whatever type of cause best explains the evidence. Okay. Let's let Peter respond to it. Is that what you're saying? Is that, I don't know, what, what's the question? When you were talking about that you think it should exclude the possibility. Yeah, I, I, again, science can explain every aspect of biological structure that we have looked at. Well, not every. We've got lots of mysteries that are still not explained. But there's not yet been one single one that we say cannot be attacked or is not being attacked or is not capable of being attacked through scientific methodology, whereas science cannot attack your sense of a intelligent creator, an intelligent designer, an intelligent science can't get at that. It's just not graspable to us, and therefore that makes your explanation not scientific. Peter, if that, if that were true, then two weeks ago in Science Magazine, there wouldn't have been two articles uh, which purported to have refuted Behe based on experimental research. Uh, clearly, people are taking up intelligent design hypotheses, and they're testing them uh, and uh, attempting to, to refute them. That's, that's, uh, we didn't agree with the refutation. We thought it but was a weak one. This is apples but, and oranges. No. No, Behe is looking at biological structures, and he's saying that this thing just cannot work in such and such a way. So there's, there's lots of testable ideas that you can look at. What we're saying is the overall arching aspect of your point of view is that there is a designer out there how do we get at that designer? I go back to my first question to you. What test well, do you, I, I, what I, test would you make up to show you that your whole idea is wrong? I, I, I think the first I test, to, I, the, the test is, I, let, let's go to some of the simulation experiments that, that you and I both are going on with, with the RNA world. Um, if someone can get RNA to self-assemble, to solve the sequencing problem without intelligent design, I will uh, resign the Discovery Institute. And I'm going to get you to resign. Can everybody, that's, we heard that. These experiments are taking place right now at Harvard. There's a reason they call it ribozyme engineering. No, 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 Look no, at no, it no, 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 no. Okay, let's try to get some more questions in here. here uh, uh, Steve, this one is for you. Please describe one experiment. I got a salary for you. <laughs> please, uh, Steve, please describe one experiment that again. demonstrates the validity of intelligent design that has been documented in a peer-reviewed scientific paper and whose results have been reproduced by non-believers in intelligent design. What was that again? That, that was a mouthful. Did you, huh? I, I didn't quite hear it. Yeah, Can you sorry. hear that again? Please describe one experiment that demonstrates the validity of intelligent design has been documented in a peer-reviewed scientific paper and whose results have been reproduced by non-believers in intelligent design. Well, there's a lot of conditionals there. Yes. Um, there's a high standard, yeah, but I think yeah, that's the question, yeah. is, is has it met, has it met yeah. that standard? That's why they call it science classes. It is hard. Yeah. Well, go ahead, Steve. There are some very uh, good scientific work going on specifically with respect to this question of uh, Behe and Miller uh, as to whether co-option or um, Behe's original design hypothesis from irreducible complexity is, is correct. And the, there, there's a key question. Which of these two systems is, is primary? And there's a lot of experimental ways to get at that question. And that work is, is ongoing right now. So it's, that's a testable hypothesis. Th that work is not yet in a peer-reviewed journal, but other peer-reviewed publications supporting intelligent design have already been published. There's a binder in the back. You can leaf through it if you're interested. Let me, let me just inject one thing on this peer review thing that we talked about a lot and it, it comes up a lot and, and there's a, a, a piece from the, uh, the trial th th where, where they talked about this. Dover. Yes, Dover, the trial where a federal judge ruled against the teaching of intelligent design. And, and it comes up in several places, I'm sure, as you know, in the, in the transcripts about what, it, what exists in terms of peer review. And this has been a real hard thing for me to kind of get my head around. Is there or is there not? And here's the passage that I think is, is telling. Uh, and Professor Behe is on the stand, and, and he's asked, um, you know, uh, you've argued, uh, uh, now you have never argued for intelligent design in a peer-reviewed scientific journal, correct? No, I argued for it in my book. Not in a peer review, no. And in fact, there are no peer reviewed articles by anyone advocating for intelligent design supported by pertinent experiments or calculations 
which provide detailed, rigorous accounts of how intelligent design of any biological system occurred. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. So that's Professor Behe, who's, you know, the best known, I suppose. Yeah, I, I, I dispute best. Mike's answer. I think, but he, um, that is what he's saying, the person yeah, who is first the First of all, there are lots of peer-reviewed publications uh, supporting ID. Okay, some of them are in books. Uh, some other important scientific uh, ideas that were first promulgated in, in books. Uh, Princi the Principia right. by Newton. Um, Starry Messenger uh, by Galileo. The Origin of Species by Darwin. Uh, when I testified in 2002 before the Ohio State Board of Education, Larry Krauss said, there are no peer-reviewed scientific articles. And then under his breath, he could have said, in, in journals that we control. Okay, there, there is a, there is... But, but, but we're shifting okay. the question. No, I'm we sure, can talk now, about exclusion. Now, I've had an you may think that's a low wait, blow. You may think that's a low blow, but I've had an experience with this. I published a peer-reviewed paper I, in a journal, The Proceedings of Biological Society, uh, that was published out of the Smithsonian Institution. I've read it. After the art, and it was based on experimental evidence. It was based on uh, arguments that I've made. It right. was it was a scientific paper. Uh, the editor was mm -hmm. deprived of his keys, his office, his access to samples. He was interrogated as to his religious and political affiliations. His closest colleagues were interrogated as to his political and religious affiliations. He eventually filed a complaint with the Office of Special, Count the Office of Special Counsel, which validated uh, the, his side of the story. So to say that, there, that peer review has not become a very conservative process when an ideologically sensitive issue is at stake in science is to be naive in the extreme. And, and, and I may be naive, but the, but the argument has been other I'm going to I'm going to put a question to you in one second here, and let, let let's let Peter respond quickly. But then we have another question for you. Let's try to get the audience questions in if we can. Yeah, I just want to read from Judge John E. Jones III, a Bush appointed jurist, who, after the many weeks in the Dover, said he was forced to come to the and this is a quote from him: the inescapable conclusion after listening to the scientific evidence that ID is an interesting theological argument, argument, but that it is not science. And he called, what is it? Oh, the uh, design, the school board members testified inconsistently or lied outright under oath. So what we saw from this Dover trial, I think, uh, you guys are writing a book to try to get back at that. Uh, that that's a pretty it's good, been, clear it's, point. It's been written. Uh, when a judge who was I mean, pre-evolved <laughs> to be happy about ID found out oh, from the we, testimony we that. and we from the that. evidence yeah. that intelligent design is not a science, this is the jurist himself in a hundred page bit of very interesting wording that I think every American ought to read. Uh, you guys have some big trouble. Um, I disagree. Um, of course I, you I, have I, to. Of course I do. Um, <laughs> they pay you. You have to disagree. Uh, I, I got paid more in the oil industry. Um, the, the, the question of what is science is a definitional matter. And the, the judge accepted the argument of, uh, of the ACLU, which is the point that you, I just point, made, that you accept a definition of science that says that you may, not, uh, you may not consider an intelligent cause for any phenomenon. If you accept that as a matter of definition, then, well, intelligent design isn't science. We are challenging that definition of science. We've come to and, agreement. And, <laughs> no, if, conditionally, you accept that definition, uh -huh. we do not. We think science should be about finding the best explanation, not the best explanation among a limited, a limited set of options. The judge also said that it was unconstitutional to, that it would be, that it would be unconstitutional to disparage evolution, which would, we haven't had that since blasphemy laws in the, in the, in the Middle Ages. I mean, we can't question the idea anymore. And he also claimed falsely, having not read our amicus brief, that there were no peer-reviewed papers or books supporting the, the theory of intelligent design. That's just false. That's in, that's in the judge's opinion, and it's false. We provided him with an amicus brief with an appendix that, that gave a list of, of, of those publications. So uh, you can't be believe everything a judge in central Pennsylvania tells you. I think you... Can we get... Let's get to another question from the audience, uh, if we can. I have, I have a question for you from the audience. Uh, 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 two parts, but I think the second one fits well in, in what we were just talking about. Didn't Darwin admit to limitations with his findings in his original text? Um, and number two, why would scientists who are evolutionists be threatened by an additional slash alternative idea that seems unscientific? 
Well, I don't think we're threatened by the ideas. Science is about competing ideas all the time. Mm -hmm. um, my sense of the threat, again, was that funny? <laughs> my sense is that our country, what do we produce in this country? You know, what keeps America going? What, what, where, how do all of you work and live? What do you do? Do you make cars? Do you make locomotives? I mean, do we, do, do we produce anything in this country? The only thing we produce anymore is brain power. The only thing we have going for us is our intellectual sense of being up at a cutting edge. And I think that's the risk here. And I think that's why a lot of us are really concerned, is that this is, it sounds so reasonable, but it is a path that leads us to mediocrity, intellectual mediocrity, because you are taking something that... All right. Uh, Peter, I, I heard this from a lot of people this morning in email, but let me ask you a quick question. Is, 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 is there a chance that by being here and having this debate, it strengthens intellectual curiosity? I, I'm, I'm certainly I'm, here. I, I'm glad you came well, here to have We're debate. opposed to teaching the controversy, but look at the interest in the controversy. Do we now? What do you do? Not tell students where you were last night? I, mean, could it, I, I want to come back to the point about intellectual mediocrity and design. I, can't, I, for the life of me, can't understand how studying a complex, functionally integrated information processing system in a biological context is going to slow us down. It is, because you're telling people we'll never understand no, absolutely it. Not. Absolutely understand not. You cannot understand Design and the application of principles of design engineering leads us to greater insight into the function of these systems. Uh, I, I, I work closely with a retired software engineer, and as you know, in this town, some of those people are rather young. And he's been working with some of our molecular biologists on some computational simulations of what evolution can do via mutation and what it can't. And one day he came to me and handed me a book called Design Patterns. And it's apparently an advanced level a manual text for software engineers. And he says, as I'm learning more and more about the information processing system in the, in the cell, he says, it gives me kind of an eerie feeling. Because I'm seeing not just digital information and an information processing system, but I'm seeing a, a design logic that mirrors but exceeds our own. But now, if, if you self-consciously begin to apply principles of design engineering to understanding life, how is that going to impede our, our, the advance of understanding about biology? I think it's going to advance it, not, 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 not impede it. Okay. Um, a, que a question for Steve from the audience. How does intelligent design explain the continuing mutation of flu virus and other bacteria? Uh, I think this, this speaks to a point uh, before of common ground. Uh, we think there are a lot of phenomena that the existing paradigm, theory, uh, whatever, it explains very well. I mean, uh, we talked about how, Peter was talking about how Einstein subsumed Newton. You know, there's still a lot of great insights in Newtonian physics that we apply in our day to day world. Um, natural selection is a real process, uh, random mutation is a real process, it can do real things. Uh, Antibiotic resistance is a great example of mutational changes that have an effect, but when you see the way m those mutations work, that they, yes, they confer a, a, a selective advantage on organisms that possess that resistance, but the, the same mutations that confer that advantage also degrade the information processing capability and the cell wall synthesis capability of the cells. Clearly, those mutations can't go on indefinitely. The mutations uh, we, we th in other words, we think there's very well-established processes of adaptive capacity, of microevolution, but we think in a larger framework, the, or the origination of the informational programs and the body plans uh, and the molecular machines is something that is better explained by design. But this is cherry-picking. You're cherry-picking. No. Yeah, you are. No, we're not saying, we'll, we'll take this one, but not this one. We'll take this one, but not this one. Yeah, we'll no, take this no, one, but not this one. It does seem a little bit like the cafeteria. Well, you'd, you'd have to know a little bit more about the science. The, the mutational processes that I was just talking about are running downhill informationally. Eventually, if you keep, mu if you keep, if you oh, keep you. mutating uh, those systems, uh, that temporary advantage is going to be swamped by the destruction of the, of the proteins and protein machines that are pro uh, involved in, 
in, in information processing. So you can't extrapolate from a system that's running downhill informationally to explain the origin of large amounts of new functional information. That requires something new. Uh, I, I had an article recently in a, in, in a London newspaper, and a, 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 a professor wrote in who works on computational simulations of evolutionary theory. He says, I don't see why they both can't be true. He says, what I see is the programmer puts the original information in the system, and then evolution takes over from there. Uh, James Shapiro at the University of Chicago is working on uh, pre-programmed adaptive capacity. And my friend Paul Nelson went and talked to him. They were on a panel. Shapiro said, you know, I can't make head or tail of what you guys are talking about with intelligent design. Nelson went to talk to Shapiro, and he said, look, you're really into this idea of pre-programmed adaptive capacity as a kind of alternative to strict Darwinism. Um, we think that's a neat phenomenon. Uh, let me ask you a question, Jim. Where does the programming come from in the first place? And Shapiro apparently said to Nelson, uh, you know, I rarely think about that. And Nelson said, but that's what we think about. And I think the two can go together. There are real evolutionary phenomena that can be studied, but the origination of the programming is something that I think requires design. Peter, are you going to respond to that? Yeah, I, I just, it just, as I listen to this, I keep asking myself the question, and this, this sounds so good, till I get to, well, I'm, I'm a curious person. Show me the designer. How? How? And show me a way through your methodology that I can understand that designer. I, I mean, I how can I how can I expose this wonderful designer? Isn't it? Aren't you curious about what the designer is, and how are you going to find out? Well, you learn the, the identity. Uh, some things about the the designer by the nature of the effects. That I think that's actually your your comment uh, betrays a little bit of a, a naive view of the way science works. Pardon the. But, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean it to be insulting. I don't. I really don't. I just mean. I think people often overlook the fact that science is indirectly inferential. There's lots of things in physics, quarks, fundamental forces that we don't observe directly. We infer them because of their explanatory power with respect to other things we do observe. Okay, well, and, let's and give we me a test. Same thing with the give me a design. test. You posit a designer there. because the attributes of intelligence explain the kind of phenomena that we see better than undirected processes. Then give me a test. I, I've given you one already. I've several. I mean, uh, they've failed my limited ability to understand your test. Here's, here's, here's a question for, for me, but I'll turn it into one for all of us. It says, why does the Seattle Times promote this as a debate about science, criticism of evolution by intelligent design supporters, promote public skepticism about science that leads to increased scientific illiteracy at a time when we can ill afford it, which is what Peter Ward has been saying. Uh, I'll answer briefly, but I'd like Actually, you guys to we I don't know that we did promote it as a debate about science, and in fact, w one of the disagreements I think that Discovery Institute has with what I wrote was that I didn't pay enough attention to the science. I'm a political reporter, not a science reporter, not a religion reporter, um, and it's, it's, we were talking about this before we came out. I think this thing, uh, this issue leaks into a lot of different areas. It is about politics. It is about the legal system in this, this country. Well, and it's, um, it's also about larger philosophical questions. If but you it, start to talk about human origins, biological origins, cosmological origins, the, the, I mean, the wonderful thing about modern science is that we can address those questions. But however you end up answering those questions, you're going to, your, your answers will have larger philosophical but implications. But you guys want to keep it wholly in science. We, 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 we do want to do scientific work that, ex that is attempting to explain evidence. But we're not, we're not uh, uh, immune to the fact that whether you take a Darwinian view, a self-organizational view, a punk eek view, uh, an intelligent design view, th that you're going to raise larger philosophical questions. To particularize my answer, uh, we were talking about the teach the controversy issue a minute ago. We think teaching the controversy promotes scientific literacy. There's in the many biology textbooks to the present day, we have errors of omission. Cambrian explosion is hardly mentioned. Nonsense. No, in, at the high oh, school level, we've, we've surveyed these. Get one short line in Miller and Levine, the rest of them hardly mention it. You still have errors of commission. Things like the, the, uh, the Heckel embryo diagrams, which have been known to be false for a long time, they're, they're still being recycled, uh, recycled in, in biology textbooks. So a critical outsider's perspective from a different theoretical point of view is, is, is very helpful in improving scientific literacy. I have to ask a question of you folks. You've asked some of us. Did anybody's mind get changed tonight? No. All right. I didn't think it would. Uh, we, that was not a requirement, though. Did we have fun? <laughs> yes. Sort of. Uh, Peter, let me ask you, the, 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 you know, you're a scientist. You come here to argue largely the science, but, you know, you talked about politics. You talked about some of these other pieces. 
what is the view of your colleagues and, and, and what you hear at the university about, about you coming to argue uh, about intelligent design? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, where I give credit to the Discovery Institute and the ID movement is that they have been tremendous public relations specialists. That as a political movement, I just take my hats off to you. That's called being damned with faint praise, and I don't yes. accept the compliment. <laughs> Uh, Others I might accept, not that one. So, so I, I see it in two ways. What if you're correct, but it's clear that the way we have taught science in this country has led us to become the premier scientific leader of the world. Our universities have no peer in the rest of the world. I mean, we can pretty well say that, and our standard of living owes an awful lot to that. So, and you're claiming that Dar uh, let me evolution finish, right? is let me responsible finish. for that? I, yeah. I'm saying science, as we teach it, is responsible for that. So what if you're right, and it turns out it's all by intelligent design? Well, but we keep teaching it the way we're teaching it. Everything's fine. But what if you're wrong, and it turns out that it was done by natural causes, but then we changed it to the way you want to teach it? Then, uh, then your, what your then? overwhelmingly compelling evidence will will show the the, uh, no, no, the fabulous thinking, nature of intelligent I, I'm design more practical in the classroom. I'm more practical than that. I'm thinking about China would love us to go down this road. They already produce more engineers than we do. They already produce more scientists than engineering we do. Engineering is a design field. I, 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 again, engineers come, back to come this point, from scientists first. Studying, studying, the, studying the biological system as a system that was actually designed as opposed to one that was only appears to be designed uh, could be very, very fruitful in understanding more about life. And in the process, we may understand more about engineering. By the way, uh, we have this list of dissenting scientists, now over 600, who question... And how many Darwin hundreds evolution. of thousands uh, of pro scientists? We have been criticized, criticized because many of the professors who have signed this are professors of electrical, uh, computer, or mechanical engineering. And one of the things I want to say to you all is that we, uh, if you have trouble... Uh, convincing smart engineers that you can build these complex systems that we find in cells, the circuits, the software, the, the, the miniature machines. If, if you can't convince engineers of that, then I think... Uh, how many engineers Darwinism out of all the engineers? For, uh, how many, look, let's be serious about this. You've got 600 people. How many scientists are there in the world who are not taking your point of view? Come on, let's be, you guys love numbers. You live on numbers. 600 versus 100,000, 200,000? Let's see. That's pretty equal, all right. Uh, w w there's no there's no data on that, but there has been a comprehensive survey of of U.S. of U.S. medical doctors. <laughs> there there isn't. We don't know that. You can't just help yourself to the remainder. Uh, yeah. the, no. no. Uh, Sixty percent. Sixty percent of U.S. medical doctors reject the full-blown neo-Darwinian evolution. Oh, where? Who says no, that? It's a recent, it's a recent survey. Oh, We've had it up on our website. Uh, Steve, you know. this, I asked you this question earlier. And, and My point really... is that people that actually have to build things are very much more sensitive to the case for design than, than qualitative biologists who can wave their hands and say mutation done it. We, we quit being vegetarians. The there is red meat in the hall. <laughs> here it is. Let's let the audience get a few more questions in here. Here's a nice easy one. How did life start? Um, and if it was uh, some form of intelligent or a bang, and if you both believe in evolution, then aren't you both basically in agreement? That's a good, I mean, do these two ar arguments, if they're not... You've got to read my book. I've got a new idea. <laughs> yeah, well, share it with the book. It, it, it is a good book, Peter. Could, yeah, it is a good and book. And do you guys agree on... How do life start? It yeah. depends on how evolution I don't know what his point of view is. Uh, my point of view is that the, is the origin of life is one of the... The problem of the origin of life which is essentially the problem of the origin of the information you need to build the living system, is, provides one of the strongest arguments for design. And you told me the same when we were backstage, that if there was a, a strong place for a creator, it's at the, at the point of the origin of the first life. Uh, I think you misquoted me on that little deal. Bruce Ballack is here, one of the great astronomers at the University of Washington. He, he told me that we could give you all the telescopes in the world if you could give us some new proofs, new ideas, new ways to test how solar systems form. My sense of the origin of life, it turns out the coolest new thing we found, it may really be related to meteor impact. And I, there's a group at Caltech who is now studying impact craters as a way to make chemistry sets. I mean, we, it's really clear you need a chemistry set to make life. You need a good test tube. An impact crater is just that kind of test tube, especially if you link them together on a slope. You can weigh of distillating material. You can get it wet, evaporate it, wet, evaporate it, wet, evaporate it. And then Steve Benner, I talked about, has figured out that borax soap 
Anybody old enough remember that Ronald Reagan was 20 Mule Team's borax? The old ranger himself, well, who knew that borax soap may be the way that life started on Earth? Borax soap, when you wet it and dry it, turns into ribose sugar. You just start adding a little chemicals and you get RNA. I mean, there's origin of life right there. I, that's what you call overlooking the, the Ronald the, Reagan yeah. theory yeah. of the origin of life. Uh, there's a big thing in origin of life called the sequencing problem. And arranging the, the parts of the molecules that function as alphabetic characters is, is the big problem. And the, 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 I, I think it is interesting, whether we're talking about genet genetic algorithms or the kind of uh, 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 ribozyme simulations that are being done, invariably to move life in a more information-rich direction, to move these molecules in a more information-rich direction, it requires input from the investigator. And I think no these, are, these are, no these are simulated. Way. The, no, 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 I, no, I, no, I, no, 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 I'll yeah. send you the papers. I mean, you're, 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 you were maybe incorrect two years ago. Harvard University just put $100 million into a center for the origin of life because they know this is about one of the hottest scientific areas in the world. And we will have artificial life, I predict, in a decade. Who's we will designing start, it, Peter? We will have, no, no, no. It's, no, it's the, sci it's the scientists in the laboratory. It's the, no, 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 no. I will, let, me, let me respond to that. We are going to recreate exactly what the early Earth was like. You know, that's designing it. You've already said that science is about recreating and experimentation. If we put the same set of chemicals together and have the same conditions, because we can't have those conditions anymore, there's oxygen and all this stuff, and shake it up in a reasonable way, this seems to be the same way that life started on this planet. Isn't this a proof that it can happen without a creator? No, it's not. It's not. It is. You're I missing. Mean, you've you're done mi a scientific experiment. You've life. used science to you're, create you're, life. You're, you're missing the crucial element here, which is the role. The role of the investigator in over the, R, the no, RNA world no. requirement, even to get simple self-replication, you need to have a molecule which is a template and also. A, a polymerase. And Cindy okay, Check won the Nobel Prize for showing that, that don't RNA can do just that. He can, you can do uh, it if you can sequence the, the, the bases in a precise way so that they have function. But who's doing the sequencing? The, what the you investigator. Have not, what you have not let us have is we're also going to give you millions of years. <laughs> and that's a quite a different let's, situation. Let's go to another question. Could either of you publicly acknowledge the weakness of your respective beliefs, philosophical or scientific? Just say no and move on. Yeah, um, let's move on. The weakness <laughs> of our beliefs? Uh, my belief is that the Mariners are just going to go to a 90 loss season. But let me ask you, I mean. Get serious? I, I'm not being paid anything. <laughs> okay, we'll see. Okay, they don't want to answer that. Um, this is a question for uh, Steve. Why do you keep saying that Darwinism is undirected? Random mutation is undirected. Natural selection is direction. It's not directed by an intelligence. That's, that's not an applause line. That's a technical question. No, it's undirected in the sense that there is no mind involved in it. And that's been part of the, the neo-Darwinian synthesis. Uh, uh, I mean, every major evolutionist would accept that. So. Um, I mean, I'm not, we're, not, we're not saying that, that, that neo-Darwinism is committed to chance. I mean, creationists will sometimes make that uh, misrepresentation theory. We understand that it's natural selection acting on random variation, but natural selection is not a, a, a directed or intelligent process. It's an undirected process that some have argued mimics the powers of a designing intelligence. Here's a designing intelligent question. Is there a bar big enough for all of us to go after this? <laughs> Peter, I, I think your mind is wandering. I'll design a drink if you all have one we, with we still, we still have more questions. Uh, Peter, here's a question for you. What is the, the strongest empirical evidence to date that clearly demonstrates vertical evolution has occurred? That is, one species evolving into a different, more advanced species. What's the strongest piece? Well, there's so many lines of those evidence, but let me go back to my own, is that I began this career of mine as a, a lowly ammonite paleontologist. I actually brought those two. And if, the beautiful thing, if you go to the rock record, is in sequences of rocks, you can watch fossils change. And in ammonites that I've studied, I've watched uh, very thick sequences of rock have the same kind of fossil, same kind of fossil, and then you have thinner sequences with transitional forms, and then thick sequences with the same fossil, the same fossil, the same fossil. So you can watch con continuation, then you can watch nice evolutionary change, and then you can see a second daughter species. Sometimes the first species keeps going sideways. This is punctuated equilibrium. 
And you can see complexity increase in my creatures. I walked into this thinking, well, I've heard so much about no missing links, right? You hear about it in grade school. It's not true at all. Fossil record is filled with these things. I, I, I agree with Peter as far as the, the lower taxonomic levels. I think at the uh, le low level of species, that's absolutely true. When you get to, uh, there, there are large punctuations at higher levels that I don't think, A, are, are doc the trend where the tra transitions are not documented. You have the mammalian radiation, you have the Cambrian explosion. Uh, these kinds of events, I think, suggest that at the higher taxonomic levels, that the discontinuity that we see in the fossil record may well be real. Though, as I said, that's a, a, a question where uh, that, that's not essential to Boy, we just found for, a nice amphibian, didn't we? Isn't that great? Uh, well, you still, you, still have, you still have no, no real transition to the, uh, the actual uh, the pod. It's supposedly a transition to tetrapod. Is Chris Seedor here? You still got to, you guys got Chris, yeah. what do you think about that? No transition? <laughs> you going to go along with that? No, you're not, not going to go for that, all right? Uh, well, that was Peter's question. Steve, a question for you. Uh, is it true that the Center for Science and Culture was responsible for sec successfully lobbying to include a provision in No Child Left Behind Act that would require states to include teaching the controversy of evolution in public schools? Uh, 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 Philip Johnson, the professor from Berkeley, uh, was uh, tapped to help draft that legislation. Uh, he's an advisor of our program and a prominent person in the ID movement, but not a, a fellow of, of the center. So that, that, okay, that's, that, my follow-up's not on the card. My question, though, is that, then, you know, you guys, it's not just science. It's not right? it is, ID it is, movement. It is a politics, movement sounds political to me. Movement. ID Sorry. movement. Hmm. The cat is out of the bag. Hold on one sec, Peter. <laughs> That, that, that's the question. Well, I mean, here, I mean, I, it just seems to me that that's where we get it. It's not just science. Yeah, of course, there's a the political context to this discussion. I mean, that's the, the, the you have to try to promote the, this. The, the, the politics is derivative of the fact that there are real scientific disagreements, and that we think that students should be permitted to know about those disagreements. Question for both of you. How does the new knowledge of quantum physics help to bridge the gap within your conversation? Peter, does it? <laughs> All right, you stumped him again. Bruce. Bruce Ballack helped. Yeah. We have a I Bruce that works on that. Is there a quantitative or mathematical means of expressing irreducible complexity? And if so, what's it based on? And if not, why not? Uh, there, the concept is originally advanced by Behe was qualitative, the idea that, that irreducible complexity could be defined as a system of many well-matched parts that perform a function such that the removal of any one of them will cause the, the function of, of, the, of the system as a whole to lose, um, to, to be lost. Uh, there are quantitative uh, innovations in our understanding there, there, there is some more quantitative analysis that's coming online that will refine that definition further. Uh, there's a scientist at the University of New Mexico named David Keller who has noticed that not only do the many parts, for example, in the, in the flagellar motor have to be present to get motility, but that the individual parts have to be built within very precise tolerances that enable you to begin to develop, and th this observation begins to enable you to develop a quantitative understanding of the degree of complexity that may be involved in, a, in an irreducibly complex system. Uh, similarly, there is work on the question of um, how, uh, uh, in an area uh, of protein design, the, the question is how rare or common are folded protein structures within the space of all the possible ways that there are of arranging amino acids. It's a quantitative question. And some of this work suggests that there are certain kinds of, there's a certain number of mutations that can occur and maintain a basic uh, protein fold, but that multi mu multiple mutations at, at uh, different sites end up effacing the structure of that protein before others come online. And that gives a sense of, again, what mutation can do and what it may not be able to do, placing some limits on mutation as, a, as an engine of biological change. So, and that's a quantitative aspect of our research program. Peter, let's put the question to you. Is there a quantitative or mathematical means of expressing irreducible complexity? Not that I know of. Okay. Um, we're certainly, if you look at the Behe arguments, uh, they're very strange. Joe Felsenstein, again, a, a theoretical geneticist in the back, has already come up with some very interesting mathematics that show that the Behe arguments just don't hold water at all. They, they require an assumption that's totally 
not the way the world works. They're saying that every mutation is always lethal. We know this isn't the case. And we know it isn't simply uh, we, just... We, we never claim that every mutation is always well, lethal. Go back and look at your own literature. No, 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 no. Look at Behe's response to this paper in Science two weeks ago. Okay. I mean, clearly, there are two mutations there, but they did not produce an irreducibly complex system. So, next question. Okay. Uh, for you, your former UW colleague, Dr. Guillermo Gonzalez, has proposed intelligent design and cosmology, the origins of the universe, and his book's been praised by the Royal Academy of Astronomy and others. Um, yes. He has peer-reviewed. Uh, do you admit that his work on intelligent design is real science? Uh, Guillermo Gonzalez does some really good real science. What he studies is the metallicity in stars. And he's looking at what stars would have planets, what don't. That work is first rate. His work on galaxies is first rate. His book's a bunch of trash. It's just crap. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you want to his, why? His book, also, his, his book also results in a number of predictions. And uh, since you've challenged me on this so many times, we'll put up tomorrow on our website some predictions that intelligent design makes. Okay. Well, let me go back to Guillermo's book. Guillermo's book is called Perfect Planet. And privileged. Oh, privileged planet. I thought it was perfect planet. So privileged planet. Uh, Guillermo's ultimate, utmost understanding is that we are the unique life form on the universe. And he, all the arguments, taking that given assumption, then all arguments he does tries to prove that. So that's where that comes from. Okay. Uh, Steve, question for you. Um, does the intelligent designer update and modify his work? Ooh, that's a good one. Does, sorry? Does the, does the intelligent designer update and well, modify he, his work? Evolution takes place, so that's... Yeah, you know, I, is it I one think, shot? Think, yeah, the, no, I think there may be... Uh, there, I think there are different loci of design in the universe that, along the timeline, and that there may be instances of design. Uh, we see them when we see large infusions of new information. So I think the Cambrian explosion is likely an event that owes its origin to design. I think that the fine-tuning of the laws of physics and chemistry, the beginning of the universe, are... Uh, are evidence of design. I think the information that you need to build the first life is evidence of design. So those are at least three events that involve the designer updating his work. But well, if we were going to give you any telescope in the world, how could you go to that first one, the origin of the universe? Could you come up with a series of astronomical tests that would tell you that it was designed and not by natural forces? Uh, could you come up with a series of astronomical tests that would tell you that the many universe hypothesis, which has been proposed as an alternative to intelligent design, uh, no, both of those are theories are, at the cosmological level are, are theories which are, are contending to explain phenomena about which we already know. Uh-oh. There's the man. Oh, so stop we're, stop we're, this. Uh, we're running out of time. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. Last, last question. Last question. Oh. Well, I'm going to change it a little bit then since that's the last one. Let, let, uh, the, somebody in the audience, Stephen, wanted to ask you the question, are you a Christian? And we talked a little bit about this before, and, and I thought it was an interesting discussion. So look, I'll put it to both of you. Do you think, one, that your own religious beliefs have any role in our discussion here tonight? First, do you? Um, I am a Christian. I think my religious beliefs have made me more open to explanatory possibilities in science than I, uh, than I would be if I were strict materialist. Because if you're strict, if you're strict materialist, if you're strict materialist, you can't consider that an intelligent cause played a role in any event um, in, prior to the advent of humans. So. Uh, I think that it, it has engendered some methodological openness, uh, the, the fact that I have a theistic perspective. Um, the one thing I would like to say about this that is I think many do, people do get confused in understanding the, this debate. I think that on both sides you have competing explanations of evidence. Uh, I think you have competing scientific theories of, of evidence, but both theories, a, a purely undirected evolutionary theory and an ideas of intelligent design have larger, uh, larger metaphysical implications. And where, where Peter's been somewhat... Um, uh, you know, taciturn about that. Many of the, the leading spokesmen in the, in the Darwinian camp, Richard Dawkins, for example, was here a year or so ago. His famous quote is that Darwinism made it, uh, fam uh, made it possible to become an intellectually fulfilled atheist. Uh, one of the things that we want to say is that, that you have to evaluate arguments and evidence uh, straight up. You, it would be completely illicit for me to critique Dawkins by saying, uh, to critique his scientific arguments by saying, well, you're an atheist and you have atheistic motives. We just want to be accorded the same respect and to have the arguments and the evidence and the experimental work that we do accorded, uh, uh, evaluated on the basis of that, not with motive mongering. You know what? That's good.
and Peter, you get you get the last word, but but it, can you try to answer our question uh, in, in in your concluding remarks? Can you try to answer that question about your own religious beliefs and does it have a role in our discussion? Well, I just want to say that some of the greatest of all evolutionists, Fisher, Haldane, Dobzhansky, were devout Christians. There is ab there hey, is hey, hey, hold on. There is absolutely because religion and science are so separate. I mean, there is absolutely no conflict. Dawkins is totally... Hey, could you just let him... Hey, is that polite? so good all What's night. wrong with you, Yahoos? Now, huh? This is a polite discourse. Only he and I yell at each other. <laughs> We're going to let you finish. <laughs> Again, Dawkins, I think, has done a huge disservice by saying that you're stupid if you're religious. I mean, this is idiotic on his part. There is no reason that a devout scientist cannot be a devout religious believer. The two are different hemispheres. If you study if you study science, in fact, it makes you more wondrous. Just having the ability to test, just having the ability to understand nature, I think, gives you a tr profound sense of religious awe. As for me, this week, I'm a druid. <laughs> okay. And with that, we're going to... We're, we're... Uh, up until the last three words, we found a, a, a good place to end with in agreement. That's Thank right, you, Peter. Yes, Thank sir. you both. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate your questions. Thank you so much.